Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 9, Part 2. So we are continuing with the correlation chapter, specifically Pearson's R, Pearson's Product Moment Correlation Coefficient stuff. That's what we've been talking about. So let's start with a review of some concepts. And this is the question. This, this scatter plot right here and the line, and specifically what the numerical representation of that line is, what kind of relationship? This is an imperfect relationship. How do I know it's an imperfect relationship? Because I've got the R right here, negative 0.84. A perfect relationship has to be either a positive one or a negative one. It can't be anything else. This line numerically represents the relationship between GPA and hours spent playing video games. Each dot is a different person. Then what it's showing you is this line is the line of best fit. It's the numerical representation of the Pearson's R. It's saying that when you look at all these dots, this line represents the line that is closest to all of the dots simultaneously, right? It's the line of best fit. It represents the relationship between GPA and hours spent playing video games. And numerically, it's a negative 0.84. That's not a perfect relationship. If it was negative one, that would be a perfect relationship. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to do some practice of what we did before. Then I'm going to give you one other concept and we'll practice some more to make sure we're ready to go. Now, remember that each one of these is a separate way, a separate way of calculating the Pearson's R. It's a separate way. You do not have to do all of them. You can do one or the other or the other. Now, we're only going to practice this first one and the second one today. We're only going to do the covariance divided by uh, S, uh, the standard deviation sub X, standard deviation sub Y. Or, and then we're going to do the Z-score one as well. But we're not going to do this last one. That's, it's, yeah, that's an animal. We're not going to mess with that one. All right. So let's go ahead and look at some data that you have seen before. And we'll do some practice. So the first thing we're going to do is look at these data. You remember these? Yep, you remember these. These data that we used before. The first question is, which of these variables, cups of coffee, their area code, hours of sleep, liking for donuts, which one of those are we not going to use in a Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, which is called Pearson's R. Which one can we not use? The answer is area code. Area code is categorical. So we cannot use it in a Pearson's R. We can't do it. I'm gonna delete it because we can't use it. Boom, we cannot do that. You cannot use categorical data in a Pearson's R. You can't do it. Let's say that I have a hypothesis that the more you sleep, the less, sorry, the more you sleep, the less hours of, uh, less cup of coffee that you drink, or vice versa, right? The more cups of coffee you drink, the less hours of sleep. So let's say that that was my hypothesis. Let's go ahead and look at that correlation between cups of coffee and hours of sleep. So for right now, let's go ahead and get rid of liking for donuts, even though we'll use that one later on. So the first thing you need to do is calculate the covariance. Calculate the covariance. So here's how we calculate the covariance. The first thing we need to do is find the deviations of coffee and then the deviations of sleep. So this is going to be x minus x bar, but we don't have x bar yet. So we got to figure out what x bar is going to be. Let's go ahead and get a mean for this. This is going to be the mean of this sample. All right. The average cups of coffee is two. The average hours of sleep is 8.57. Those are our averages. Deviation is going to be x, participant one, drank two cups of coffee, minus the average, which happens to also be two. I'm gonna put in my dollar sign so that it doesn't mess up my Excel. The deviation for person one in cups of coffee is zero because the average was two cups of coffee. 
and then here's the deviation for everybody else. We do the same thing for sleep. We need the deviation hours of sleep. So participant one slept for six hours minus the mean of 8.57. This deviation is X minus X bar when X bar is the mean. All right. So the deviation for participant one for sleep is negative 2.5714, et cetera. Good. So what we've done so far is we've gotten the deviations for coffee and the deviations for sleep. All right. Then what we're going to do is we are going to multiply these and then add them up. So just to remind you what the, the covariance, the uh, formula for the covariance is, this is not the formula for the covariance, this is the formula using the covariance to get R. The formula for covariance is up here. Where are you from last chapter? Come back. Where are you? Oh, did I skip it already? No, I didn't. Where are you, covariance? Oh yeah, I did skip it. And there it is. Covariance, there it is. X minus X bar times Y minus Y bar. You add them up and you divide by N minus one. That's what we're remembering what we did. All right, so let's go back. We got to get the covariance, the covariance of the data that we've got. So far, what we've done is we've calculated the deviations. Now we need to multiply them and then add them up. So this is going to be the product of deviations. That means that this is going to be the deviations for cups of coffee times the same person's deviation for sleep. And we do that for each person. We get the product for each person in the sample. So let me move this over so I can do that. All right. So this is each of the products. Then to get the covariance, the next thing we need to do is get the sum of all of those. So this is the sum of all of the products of deviations. Did I mess up? Oh, I didn't actually put in my parentheses. The sum of all the products of deviations. I'm having more trouble today. There. Okay, so here's the sum of all the products of deviations. Let's make sure we got them all. We did. They all add up to one, just happened to in this particular case. Then the covariance will be that sum of the product of the deviations divided by n minus one. n here is seven, there's seven participants, minus one is six. So it's one divided by six, it's gonna be 0.2. So the sum divided by N minus one is the covariance, that's going to be 0.2. Let's go and expand this out a little bit. You can see that it's actually not quite 0 0.2, 0 0.167 there, that is a little bit better. All right, that's the covariance. Now, in order to find the Pearson's R, the next thing we need to do is the product of the standard deviations. So let me show you on the formula sheet. We need to get the covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations. So let's go ahead and do that next. And I'll move this over so we can see everything a little bit better. Whoops, not that far. All right, cups of coffee, the mean was two, standard deviation is going to be the standard deviation of these numbers right here. So we would take those deviations, we would square them, we would add them up, 
divided by n minus one and then take the square root and we get this standard deviation. Then we're also gonna get the standard deviation for hours of sleep. which is gonna be this right here, all right? So those are our two standard deviations, the two standard deviations. So what I need to do next is get the product of the standard deviations. So I'm gonna move this over so I can see it. So I want the product. product of the standard deviations is going to be this standard deviation for cups of coffee times this standard deviation for hours of sleep. Just to show you where we're at, these are the standard deviations for cups of coffee for hours of sleep. We're going to take uh, 1.5275 times 1.988 and we get 3.0368. Pearson's R is going to be the covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations. R equals 0 0.05. R equals 0 0.05. Okay, so the closer you are to zero, the less correlation that's going on. What this is saying is based off of these data that we have right here, when we're looking at the number of cups of coffee that people drink and the hours of sleep, we want to see if the hours, the cups of coffee and the hours of sleep, if they correlate with each other. As one goes up, does the other go up? As one goes down, does the other go down? And what this is saying is that we calculated a positive correlation, meaning that the correlation is 0.05 as Cups of coffee go up, hours of sleep actually goes up, according to our data, right? But the question is, is it significant? Anything that's not zero is telling you there's a relationship between those variables. Anything that's, that's significant says there's a relationship between those variables. So this is saying, this 0.05 is saying that there is a relationship between sleep of cups of coffee and it's positive, it's saying that as you drink more coffee, you get more sleep. That's what that says right there. Now, do you, do you believe it? Should you believe it? That is a different question. Now, in order to do this, we have to look at a distribution. Now, remember we talked a lot about sampling distributions in the past. We talked about sampling distributions and comparing it to sampling distributions, et cetera. So the way that you do this is number one, you, correct, you, uh, you um, calculate the correct statistic. So the correct statistic for us was 0 0.05, right? We did that step one, okay? That was step one for evaluating the statistic. The next step is to look at the distribution, right? To see if we should, the sampling distribution, see if we should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So let's assume that our standard is gonna be 0 0.05, alpha equals 0 0.05. Let's assume that our standard is alpha equals 0 0.05. And that means that we need to look at a distribution that represents these, uh, this statistic of Pearson's R. Now, one thing that's really important is that when we normally do this, normally we look at what's called a two-tailed test. The, we, the reason why we do this is because the null hypothesis is that nothing's going on, right? There's no, there's no relationship between coffee and sleep. That would be the null hypothesis. But remember, you can, you can talk about the hypothesis going either way. Our hypothesis was that the more coffee you drank, the less sleep you got. But theoretically, it could go the opposite direction, right? Meaning the more coffee you drank, the more sleep you got. In fact, in this case, this R equals 0 0.0549, that's saying that the more coffee you sleep, the more sleep you get. There are what we call two tails, meaning the tails of the distribution. We want the probability of us getting this number right here, we want the probability of us getting that to be less than our alpha, which happens to also be 0.05 in this case, okay? The distribution that we've talked about, the sampling distribution looks at the probability, the probability of getting the value of the statistic, so, 
y-axis is probability, x-axis is the value of the statistic. If the null hypothesis is true, and since we don't want the null hypothesis to be true, we want our probability to be less than, we want our probability of getting a 0 0.0549 to be less than our standard of 0 0.05. We want it to be less than, because we want the probability be, to, probability to be super small that it's happening when the null hypothesis is true. Now, two tails means that the probability could be, we have, we're talking about splitting that probability of 0 0.05 between does coffee make you sleep more or coffee make you sleep less, right? That is a two-tailed test, and that is the standard. Technically, you could do a one-tailed test, but in general, we do a two-tailed test. So how do we do this? Well, that means we need some sort of a distribution of scores that represent Pearson's R. But the problem is you actually don't use a distribution of Pearson's R when you're looking at the sampling distribution. We have to transform this R into a different distribution called a T distribution. So we actually have to transform this into what's called a T distribution. So let me show you how to do that. So back to these slides. We have to transform this into a T because there's a T distribution. There really isn't a, an R distribution. Remember, R is meant to be a representation of a line. It's not meant to be like, you know, part of a, uh, a distribution. And so what we do is we transform the R into a T because there is a T distribution. We're going to talk about T quite a bit later on. So we are looking for how to change R into T, and this is how we do it. We take r times the square root of n minus two divided by one minus r squared, the square root of one minus r squared. All right, that's what we're gonna do. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We need r times the square root of n minus two divided by the square root of one minus r squared. So let's take a look. Here's what we've got so far. We've got r, right, which is this one. Let me go ahead and delete this circle so it's out of my way. R is 0 0.0549. So what we need to do first is let's get uh, the square root of n minus 2. If you remember, when we looked at the formula, it is, there it is, r times the square root of n minus 2. So we got to get the square root of n minus 2 first. In this case, our n I'll move it over so you can see it. N equals seven, right? So when we're looking for the square root of N minus two, we're looking for the square root of seven minus two, which is five. So this is going to be the square root of five, because five is N minus two. All right, R times square root of N minus two. is going to be r times 2.2361, which is the square root of five. One point, excuse me, 0.1227. Now, the next thing we need to do is get r squared because we need to get the square root of one minus r squared. So r squared is this squared, 0 0.003. One minus r squared is one minus 0 0.003. So that means that our t statistic is going to be r times the square root of n minus two divided by, oh, we forgot to square root it, didn't we? We need to square root the one minus r squared. So let me do that first before we forget. This should be the square root of one minus r squared.
There you go. Then our t is going to be r times the square root of n minus 2. This one right here, 1.227 divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. So the t statistic, t is going to equal r times the square root of n minus 2 divided by square root of 1 minus r squared. All right. And that's going to give us a t statistic of 0.1229. All right. Now let's assume that our alpha is 0.05. Then what we need to do then is we, let's go ahead and look at a table because this is what we use tables for is to figure out the table. Now we need to talk about something called a critical value. A critical value is a value of the statistic that has the same p-value as alpha. So if you look at this little thing right here, we have these cutoffs because we've split alpha into two different tails, right? We have split 0.05 into two different tails. It's a two-tailed test. So what we want to know is so this cutoff point, that has a p-value, probability of getting that when the null hypothesis is, uh, is true, equal to alpha. And our alpha is 0 0.05. That's the standard that we set. We got to decide that. Well, what is the value of that statistic? The value of that that has the p-value of 0 0.05 is called the critical value. OK? Generally, in the middle, you have a value of 0, meaning no relationship. If the null hypothesis is true, the thing that you would you would most likely get is a statistic of zero. So the farther away you get from zero, normally the more uh, likely the the lower the probability of getting it by chance. The p-value decreases. Notice how the probability this curve it goes down the farther away you get from the middle. Right, the probability goes down, and we want the probability to go down. We want the p-value to be less than 0.05. That's what we want because we want the probability of us getting this number, 0 0.0549, to be less than our alpha, 0 0.05. And so when we look at a table, what we're doing is we're looking for a critical value, a critical value. It's going to be the value, in this case, of t. Remember, we just calculated t. The value of t that has a p-value of 0.05. And we know that if our t-value 0.12229 is more extreme than that, if it's farther away from zero, then whatever the critical value happens to be, then our p-value is going to be smaller because the farther away you get, the lower the probability. And we want our probability to be low. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a t-table. Now, here's what you see. Here on this t-table, you see that there's different levels of significance. When people talk about a significant statistic, they're talking about whether the p-value is less than whatever their alpha happens to be. So this is a p-value of 0.05 for a two-tailed test, for a two-tailed test. All the numbers that you see in here all the numbers underneath these columns, these are the critical values. Now, degrees of freedom is something else, right? Degrees of freedom is, remember how we had a different, uh, we had different probabilities if we had n, n equals 2 or n equals 3 or n equals whatever? Well, the degrees of freedom is based off of your n, generally, right? And for Pearson's R, it's n minus 2. So, we had seven people. So the actual degrees of freedom for us is five. N minus two is five. Remember we did that with the T and N minus two is five. So that means that the critical value is 2.571. This is the value of the statistic. This is the value of the statistic. So you notice these cutoffs right here. 2.571. Has a p value 
equal to 0 0.05 when you split the p-value into two tails, right? That means if you want to reject the null hypothesis, you better have a statistic, a t-value that's out here that's more extreme than 2.571, that's farther away from zero than 2.571. Now, if you remember, when we calculated our t statistic, we got a t of 0 0.1229, 0 0.1229. So when we look over here, our statistic is right about there, 0.1229. Should we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis? we should fail to reject the null hypothesis because this value, 0.1229, is here, right? It's in the middle. It's saying the probability of you getting that if the null hypothesis is true is really high. Probability of you getting that when coffee and sleep have nothing to do with each other, that's really high probability that you got that. You wanted to get a T statistic that was greater than 2.571. So if you got like a statistic of 3.5 or 4.8 or something like that, then you could reject the null hypothesis. But yours, ours in this case, 0.1229 is less than the critical value of 2.571. So we have to fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, let's do another example. Let's do another example. So this time we are going, I'm gonna go ahead and erase these things. Let's look back at our data. Let's do the same process, but this time we're gonna do an example using hours of sleep and liking for donuts. So my hypothesis is the more you sleep, the more you like donuts. Got it? So let's go ahead and get rid of cups of coffee and area code because we don't need those. We'll just delete them. All right, and let's go ahead and calculate the covariance for hours of sleep and liking for donuts. So first, let's go ahead and get the means. For each of those. So the mean hours of sleep is 8.57. The mean liking for donuts is 5.43. I'm gonna go ahead and do the standard deviations while I'm here. We'll need those later. We don't need them exactly right now. Standard deviation for hours of sleep is 1.99 hours, almost exactly two hours. And the standard deviation for liking for donuts is 2.88 liking units, whatever those happens to be. So let's go ahead and calculate our covariance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and insert this. Let's get a deviation for sleep. So this is going to be X minus X bar. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put my dollar signs in there. So person one has a deviation of negative 2.57 hours of sleep. So the average is 8.57. This person only slept for six, so their deviation is negative 2.57. Those are all the deviations for sleep for everybody. Let's get the deviations for lagging for donuts. All right. I'm go ahead and make these columns just a little bit wider. Okay, so this is going to be X, in this case Y, Y minus Y bar. Those are the deviations, that's a deviation for participant one. And we get each of the deviations. So 
We've gotten all the deviations. Now we need to get the product of the deviations. We need to multiply them. The product of the deviations, that's going to be the deviation for sleep times the deviations for liking for donuts for each person. Let's get all of them. Great. Then we're going to add them up. It's going to be the sum of all of these deviations. Then to get the covariance, we take that divided by n minus 1. Let's just show you one more time to remind you what it looks like. We are looking at, we are looking at the covariance, which is this. The deviations times the deviations, sum them up, and then divide by n minus 1. So what we've done so far is we got the deviation times the deviation, and now we're going to we summed them up, and now we're going to do it divided by n minus 1. n is 7, n minus 1 is 6, 0 0.0476. So the covariance for liking for donuts and hours of sleep is 0 0.0476. Next, we get the product. So we're going to, we're going to get the product of standard deviations. Product of standard deviations. That is going to be the standard deviation per hour of sleep times the standard deviation for liking for donuts. 5.7226. Then we calculate R. We take the covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations, and we get an R of 0 0.0083, 0 0.0083. Okay, so we calculated our Pearson's R using the covariance method. We got 0 0.008321. Now let's do it the other way using z-scores, using z-scores. Now to remind you, the particular formula that we're looking at is we're going to take the z-score for x, so the z-score for sleep, times the z-score for y, which is liking for donuts, right? So z-scores for sleep and liking for donuts. We're going to multiply each of those. We're going to add them all up, and then we're going to divide that by n minus 1. It's going to give us the same Pearson's r. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So what we need to do first is get our z-score for hours of sleep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and insert right here. A variable, this is going to be the z score for hours of sleep. All right. That's going to be each person's x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation. Sorry, x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation. I said it right. So x minus x bar is the deviation right there. x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation. All right, that's what we're looking for now. So in this case, x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation, this person has a z-score of negative 0.29, et cetera. We get the z-score for everybody. Here's everybody's z-scores for hours of sleep. Let's do the same thing for liking for donuts. We'll move over a little bit so we can see them. So let's go ahead and insert a variable right there. This is going to z-score for donuts. This is going to be the deviation, x minus x bar, in this case, y minus y bar, divided by the standard deviation for y, which is donuts. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and do this right because I didn't didn't do this right. So it's the deviation 
divided by the standard deviation. All right, put my little dollar signs in there so that I can just fill these in. Okay, so now what we've done is we've gotten the z-score for everybody. Here's the z-scores for hours of sleep. Here's the z-scores for donuts. Now what we do is we get the product of the z-scores. I'm gonna put those over here. Let's make this a little bit wider just for fun. I'll put them over here in my J column. Oh, come on, J column. It wants to be separated somehow. Okay, here it goes. So this is gonna be the product of z-scores. So this is gonna be the z-score, come on. The z-score of, go back over here, sleep. So this z-score right here, the z-score of hours of sleep times the z-score for liking for donuts. We're gonna do that for each person. So let me move these over so that I can see them better. Great, there they are. Those are all the products of the z-score. Now, the formula is we take the product of the z-score that we add them up, divide by n minus one. So we need the sum of these products of z-score. Okay. Maybe I should actually do this correctly. Make sure we didn't mess anything up. So we want the sum equals sum of the product of the z-scores. There, there's the product, the sum of the product of the z-scores. Then we take that one divided by n minus one. So this divided by n minus one, n is seven, n minus one is six, and we get the same thing, 0 0.0083, 0 0.0083. Now, if my hypothesis was that I think that people who sleep more like donuts more, well, that number, 0 0.0083, is the value of R that says, yeah, you're right. There is a relationship. But should we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis? Well, that depends on whether or not we would get this value of R, 0 0.0083, if the null hypothesis were true. If the null hypothesis were true. And so the next step we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to calculate the T statistic. Now to calculate the T statistic, we need to use, if you remember, we need to use, ah, come back. We need to use the formula for calculating t, which is this, r times n the square root of n minus 2 divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. Okay, so we need to do r times the square root of n minus 2. Let's do that first. So the square root of n minus 2 is the square root of 5. So we want the square root of five, 2.2361. Then we wanna take r times square root of five, which is the square root of n minus one, n minus two, sorry. So that's gonna be r times the square root of n minus two, which is five right there. 0 0.0186. All right, the next step is to get the square root of one minus r squared. So let's go ahead and get r squared. So that's gonna equal this squared. Okay, that's really close to zero. All right. 
not going to help us to do that. Okay. Then the next part is to do one minus r squared. which is going to be pretty close to 1. Then we take the square root of that. Which is square root of 0.999, whatever this is. OK. Then, now that we've taken the square root of 1 minus r squared, t is going to be r times the square root of n minus 2 divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared, 0 0.0186. That's our t statistic. This is not the p-value. This is the value of the t statistic. Not the p-value, it's not the probability of getting that t-statistic, it is the t-statistic. When we look over here at this table, and we're doing a two-tailed test of n, uh, where the degrees of freedom are n minus 2. That means the critical value, again, is 2.571. That means we would have had to got a t-statistic of greater than 2.571. Our t-statistic, the t-statistic that we calculated, was so small, it was, what was it again? 0 0.0186, 0 0.0186. Now that T statistic is saying that there's a relationship between the variables. That is what it's saying. But the probability of getting a 0 0.0186 is so high when the null hypothesis is true that, that we've got to fail to reject the null hypothesis. We want our t value to be way out here. We want it to be way over here, something like a three and a half or a four or five or whatever it happens to be. But ours is a two, uh, ours is a 0 0.0186, which is not anywhere close to the critical value of 2.571. All right. I think we've done everything that we need to do and we will end there. Thanks everybody.